go button here. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astroimaging channel. Uh, Alex is not here today, so I'm Eric. I'm going to be doing the short hosting introduction. And the, tonight we have uh, Tom Momari from the JPL lab, and he's part of the, the Juno camera team. And if you haven't seen these Juno images and know how they're put together, they are extraordinary. Also, I'm sure Tom will tell you, but those images are available for anyone to download and do their own version of it. And there really have been some interesting postings of you know, revisions of those Juno images. So he'll show you where to do that and you can take advantage of it if you want. A uh, couple other short announcements. If you haven't seen our shorts, you know, short announcements, shorts, we have about 20 of these. These are little 10 minute uh, specials that we've had over previous shows would show how to do one process or another. They've had a lot of traffic. I would recommend you go in, you look us up on YouTube and kind of look through those things. They're really short. They're well labeled. Uh, we're going to put up some more, you know, as time allows. And anyone that has an idea of what kind of short they want, they've seen it on the program before, we will clip it out there. We'll put a little text around it and We'll have another bit of instruction. And I think that makes you know the value of the astroimaging channel a little bit of astrophotography. I won't go into the schedule. We have a couple things coming up. Uh, we have gentleman Brian Cogdale is going to talk about remote imaging. The week after that, we have see who's coming up. Uh, Conrad Sanders is going to talk about his joint his journey on astrophotography. Those are always very interesting because we all have our unique uh, journey. Although it usually starts out with a telescope we got as a kid or something we purchased and then we're off to the races with more equipment. And after that, we're gonna have a workshop on the California Nebula. That data was posted. You can still download it from our site and we'll have all those versions of California on that third week. And I think if you want to read more about the schedule, just you know, go in to the astroimagingchannel.org and you can see the whole thing. Also, once again, anyone who is interested in doing a presentation, there is a form in there. You can just send us a note, say, I'd like to do a presentation on one subject or another. Someone will get in, top, in touch with you and uh, we'll get you on the schedule. Uh, I think that's all I have for now. And I'm going to turn this over to Tom. So. It's all yours, Tom. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Let me get my presentation up here. Uh, okay. Should be sharing my screen. It's looking good. Okay. So hopefully yep, everyone can good. see that. Yep. Okay. So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Tom Momry, as has been said, and I'm from the JunoCam team on the Juno mission um, at Jupiter right now. I'm from Jet Propulsion Laboratory is where I work. Uh, so studying Jupiter now, uh, formerly I spent 15 years on the Cassini mission studying Saturn. And before that, I was on Galileo, also studying Jupiter. I also uh, do a lot of uh, ground-based astronomy from uh, telescopes on Mauna Kea, the big big scopes up there, and on, more recently on Palomar, uh, looking at the outer planets and the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. So, and uh, someone was mentioning how you get started. I got started as an amateur with a little eight-inch Celestron. So that's how I got my start in high school. So, <laughs> and here I am. So tonight. I was going to tell you a little bit about Juno at Jupiter, uh, looking specifically through the eyes of the Juno cam camera. And so this is a, uh, an image of Jupiter from 
JunoCam, and this is the Juno spacecraft. This is how JunoCam takes images in uh, three different filters, RGB plus a methane filter. So I'll get into that in a little bit. All right, and feel free if you have questions, just type them in the chat and, and uh, they will let me know, or I'm happy to stop and answer some questions, or we can do it afterward. Okay, so a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about. First, I'll start a little bit, tell you about the Juno spacecraft and the JunoCam instrument. A little bit about the extended mission. We're on our extended mission now. Uh, the primary mission ended in June of 2021. So NASA extended us for another four years. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, show you a lot of recent JunoCam images that have come down from the spacecraft in the last few months and a little bit about the science we're doing. I think that'll be interesting. Then I'll give you a little bit of a tour around the Mission Juno website, which is the portal where all these images are. And we post them as soon as they come down from the spacecraft. And they're there for everybody to download and play with and upload back to the website. So we encourage that. A little bit about uh, citizen science, which is kind of something that Juno is pioneering. The Juno mission hasn't really been done before, but we're engaging the public, everybody to participate in the Juno mission with us and to help us with the science as well as art and um, visualization and other things. So I'll say a little bit about that and then a little bit about processing JunoCam images and how you can go about that. And if we have some time, I'll show you a little bit of artwork that people are doing because it's not just science, it's also art. And that's pretty cool too. Let me hide this thing here, okay. So, all right, so Juno is a pretty big spacecraft, not as big as a flagship mission, but pretty big. And it's about 80 feet across, uh, do these solar panels, which are state of the art, by the way. We've got a number of different instruments on board. So I'll go through those a little bit. There's Jade, which is an auroral mapper. There's uh, the JEDI instrument, which is a energetic particle detector, so detecting high energy particles. We've got UVS, which is an ultraviolet spectrograph, uh, sensitive to ultraviolet radiation. We've got JunoCam, I'll say a, little, a lot more about that. That's the visible uh, imager. We've got JIRAM, which is the infrared camera and spectrometer. So it's taking images in infrared, very cool. We have plasma waves, so that's uh, everything magnetosphere. The microwave radiometer is a kind of a unique instrument on Juno, and it is a thermal imager, and it's got different channels which are probing different levels in the atmosphere. So you get kind of a 3D view. We're probing down deep, so that's been very useful. And then we have the magnetometers, which are also probing the magnetic field, and then the gravity science, so we're probing the gravity field. Okay, so on to JunoCam. So JunoCam is a, uh, a fixed mounted, fixed field of view push frame camera. It's a visible camera. And it's taking images in, in the four colors in blue, green, red, and then uh, a methane filter, uh, 0.89 microns methane. And it acquires images, they're 58 degrees wide, so it's a pretty big field of view, 1600 pixels. And we do something called time-delayed integration, which allows us to build up uh, signal-to-noise. And uh, it's built by Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. So what happens, I guess I will show you in the next slide, but Juno is rotating. This is a still, but I have an animation coming up. So Juno is rotating. Uh, about two rotations a minute. And so all the cameras, all the instruments are sweeping across Jupiter as we fly by. So let me see if this works here. Okay, so here you see Juno spinning around. And what I'm showing you is the JunoCam uh, field of view. So this is how JunoCam takes images across the planet. We sweep along and we're taking simultaneous images almost simultaneous in the different filters. And then uh, we keep sweeping as we're moving and then we build up a whole image that way. The, these are little framelets and we build up a whole image. So that's that. Okay, 
So um, one thing I was going to mention about GenoCam is that it was actually intended to be, it was just intended to be an education of public outreach cameras. It's a CZD, you know, pretty pictures. That's how it started out. That's what it was going to be. Uh, but it turns out that we're getting such great images, uh, so clear, and there's science in those images. So we've been squeezing a lot of science out of this camera. So it's become a science instrument as well. And we're trying to have everybody participate in that with us. So the Juno mission, extended mission, we launched in uh, August 5th, 2011. We got to Jupiter uh, July 4th, 2016. We arrived on the dusk side. And uh, the primary mission went till, uh, well, about June of 2021. We had a close encounter with Ganymede. The PJs were refer to perijove that's when we sweep close to the planet these are long elongated orbits as you can see so we spend a lot of our time way out in space and then we swoop in and that's a perijove we're you know within 3500 kilometers of the planet we sweep from the north pole to the south pole and so that's a perijove and we flew by ganymede perijove 34 very close and it actually altered our orbit we were in 53 day orbits and now we're in 43 day orbits because of Ganymede. The extended mission is going to be uh, extending and uh, building on what we did in the primary mission, a lot of the science, mapping the gravity field, magnetic field, aurora, everything. But one of the new wrinkles is that we are going to do close flybys of all these satellites. So we've got a very close flyby of Europa coming up in September, late September. And a lot of good stuff going on at Europa, as you probably know. Um, and then later on in the mission, we'll be sweeping by Iowa a couple times, close flybys, look at the volcanoes going off there. So we're just about heading into the dawn side of Jupiter. So we're complete 180 degrees from where we arrived. We're here. And then uh, the end of the mission is nominally October of 2025, which we will deorbit and head into Jupiter's atmosphere. Okay, so getting into the good part, this is the images. Um, let's go. So this is from PJ43, which we just finished. Uh, that was July 5th. And this is by a citizen scientist. Her name's Andrea Luck. And she, uh, this is part of an approach movie. So what it's showing is Juno coming in from out in space to uh, uh, a flyby perijove heading over one of the poles, probably the North Pole. Okay, and so this is a collage, uh, probably from the same image set. This is Brian Swift did this, and so this shows you shows us, you know, approaching from further out and heading in, sweeping over the poles. Now the polar regions are very interesting. Juno is in a polar orbit, so we're sweeping over both the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, you, you guys know probably that since Jupiter is only three degrees tilt, uh, we don't get to see the poles from Earth. Uh, try as hard as you can with as big a telescope as you can, and we don't usually see much of the poles. But Juno is giving us a really close look at what's going on at the poles, and it's actually very interesting. There's a lot of these giant vortex vortices going on at both poles, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the poles, of course, are where the banded structure of Jupiter breaks down, and so you have a lot of vorticity going on up there. So this is another kind of uh, another collage of various images as we came in from out far and in close. So this is sweeping along the planet as we go from North Pole to South Pole and then head back out. Hopefully you guys can see my pointer okay. All right, so. Yes, I did that. All right, so this is a set of, uh, well, it's an image by Bjorn Johnson, he's he's a good citizen scientist. He does a lot of good work with the images. And he likes to do before and after kind of true color, which is on the left. This is how 
the Juno Cam images actually look. And then after you've enhanced it and played with it and done a lot of fun stuff with it, this is what it looks like. And this is where all the colors pop out and all the the vortices pop out and a lot of other things, which I'll talk about in a minute. So uh, that's the good stuff you can do when you're processing. And this is a, just a close-up view of that same image. Uh, one thing to note is these little bright clouds uh, on the edges of, of, of the vortices and in other turbulent areas, they are what we call pop-up clouds. And it's a phenomenon we, we discovered when uh, we got up close. And what they are is little, uh, little clouds that are wafting up above the lower cloud deck. And the interesting thing about these is that they're, I don't know if you can see it here, but there's probably a, a I think there's a better image later where they, they cast shadows on the cloud deck below. And because of that, we can calculate al altitudes for those clouds, um, how far up they are above the lower cloud deck. So we're getting altitude information. That's just geometry and shadows. Okay, yes, here's a, a closer look at some of these pop-up clouds. And we've got a number of people on the Junocam team that are studying these right now. Let's see what I wanted to say about pop-up clouds. They look kind of like cumulonimbus on Earth, but they're not thunder clouds. There's no lightning involved in these. So, and we think that they're probably ammonia crystals that are condensing out very high up in the atmosphere, uh, brought up by vertical convection. I probably said most of that in this slide. Uh, they're fairly small. I mean, they're probably 25 to 50 kilometers across. We, It looks like they're about 15 to 20 kilometers above the lower cloud deck, judging by the shadows. We don't see lightning here, although we see lightning in other places. Uh, but they're all over the planet, which was kind of an interesting discovery that JunoCam has made. Uh, I remember the first images that we saw of these, we were, we, it was something like this bottom image here, and we, we were saying, what the heck is that? And it was almost like it was sparkling. But you don't see it until you process the images. It, the, the, the true color images, it, you don't see it as much. As you can see here, it's very bland until you um, play with it a little bit. And then you get to see some of the colors popping out and these other features. This is Bjorn Johnson again. Tom, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So these are RGB images. How do they map out the uh, the infrared data? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't even shown any uh, methane data. Uh, it's it's a little problematical. What we've discovered is we're we're having trouble with it because it has glint. It has some kind of glint in the in the instrument that messes up the methane images. Now, we still are using them, and they're still interesting. Uh, we get altitude information from that uh, because the methane uh, band is sensitive to higher higher clouds, clouds that are higher in the atmosphere. So, But they don't look very pretty because we've got banding in them and everything. So, um, so that's the methane. And we've been experimenting with different integration times and trying to fiddle with it to see if we can uh massage it a little bit so hey, the most, yeah oh yeah go ahead chandra shekar asked uh did he he just wanted a confirmation did he hear two rotations per minute yes Is that right a, two rpms two rpms so you're getting less than 30 seconds of exposure as it's uh as it turns around on each pass is that right yeah we're, we're scanning along uh-huh great great thank you yeah sure Okay, so uh, thank you for those questions. Those are great. Keep them coming. So this is another feature that we see that's very ubiquitous on Jupiter. And, uh, you guys may know about uh, this. I, I can't remember if I think they're visible from Earth, but they are. We call them folded filamentary regions, which are basically just chaotic, sprawling, very big uh, features, seven, ten thousand kilometers long. We do see lightning in these features. 
And we are not entirely sure whether they are uh, vortices here unwinding and spinning down or whether they're the precursor to vortices spinning up or whether it's just some kind of chaotic thing that happens between vortices. These are up in the nor north and south and near the poles. So it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And we do, do see a lot of pop-up clouds in here too. So these have been known. This is not something that Juno discovered. These have been known since Voyager and before Pioneer. OK, so when we get up to the poles, we have these massive, what we call circumpolar cyclones. And they are uh, on the order of 2,000 kilometers across. They are in, well, they're all over in the, the uh, polar regions, as you can see. It's very chaotic, and there's a lot of vorticity going on and things spinning up and spinning down. But there's a stable configuration of these at both poles. And the north, it's uh, about eight of them. It's a kind of an octagonal structure that is, it, they kind of wiggle around, but they're stable in this octa octagon. And there's a, I'll show it in a minute. And in the south, there's uh, five of them. It's a pentagon. And we don't know why, <laughs> but it's, it's very interesting. You don't see this on Saturn. So there's something different about Jupiter. And this image was processed by Kevin Gill. He's, he's pretty ubiquitous on the, web, on the website. When we go on there, you'll probably, if you poke around on there, you'll see Kevin's work. OK, so yes, this is the uh, North Pole. And this is what I was talking about, where we have, where's my pointer? OK, we have eight of these stable. They're stable. And then we have a big one in the center here. And we've been watching them ever since we got there. And they're there. They move around a little bit. They kind of rotate around. But they stay in the stable configuration. We're trying to figure out why. Occasionally, one of uh, a new one will try to burst in here and push the others aside, but usually doesn't last that long. And then it gets kicked out again. So very interesting stuff going on at the poles. Um, and this is something Brian Swift uh, put together. It's a little bit of motion. Because uh, we're zipping by so fast, uh, we don't get a lot of time series on these things. So it's hard to make animations with the Junocam images, but we can get little, little hints of how things are rotating. And we even see that the interiors of these structures are rotating opposite what the rest of the uh, vortex is doing. So very interesting stuff going on. And another thing that's going on in the circumpolar cyclones is lightning. We've detected lightning up there. And this is a discovery image, actually. This is a Genocam discovery image of lightning, as you can see right here. There it is. And it flashed in the green filter, but not in the red and the blue. And we're taking images about 0.5 seconds separation when we sweep along. So that puts a time limit on how long that flash was. Um, but it's it's spatially resolved. I mean, it's not a pinpoint. It's actually resolved. It's associated with the vortex motions here. And this is the furthest north that we've seen lightning. But we're seeing lightning all over the planet, especially in the northern hemisphere, which we're trying to figure out. So and lightning is associated with water. So is something to do with the water cloud down low. And this is the South Pole, which is similar, uh, except there's only five with the sixth one in the center. Uh, again, don't really know why that is, why there'd be eight in the north and six in the south, but um, there it is. And so we've been studying those for a while now. Uh, we are, as we go further in the extended mission, we're getting better and better views of uh, the North Pole. And so we'll be getting clearer and clearer images of these things and perhaps more movement, more time series. Okay, so this is just a global image. Uh, this is early in the mission, Perijo 6. And 
that is flying over the South Pole. This is after we've passed over the North Pole, passed the equator, and we're heading over the South Pole. Just thought it was a neat image. We haven't really seen this view since Pioneer. OK, and uh, in the early perigos, we actually flew right over the red spot. So everybody knows and loves the red spot. We've been studying it from Earth forever. Been there for 200 years. So we got some close-up views of it. And this is one of them uh, processed by Kevin Gill. And I just thought it was pretty interesting. We've been watching things flake off the edges of the red spot. And uh, a lot of the amateur astronomers uh, who are watching all the time, as you guys are watching all the time, alert us to these events going on. And then we can train JunoCam. We can, if we fly over, we can take a good look at what's going on. And a recent discovery from Juno is that the Great Red Spot is not very deep. Uh, it's been an open question for a long time. How deep is the Great Red Spot? How far down does it go? And it turns out this is from gravity data uh, that it's not very deep. It's more like a pancake. It's about 500 kilometers. And that's about the distance up to the space station from our Earth's surface. So this is a little graphic that I did to illustrate that. This is a giant thunderstorm that we happen to fly right over. And the, so uh, I've got a colleague at JPL, Sean Bruchaber, who's leading the effort to study this. We had all our instruments trained on this thing. And so especially MWR got lots of depth information. It was looking at different levels, different channels, different levels in the atmosphere. So we've got a lot of, of imagery of this big thunderstorm. And we're going to study what's going on there. And, uh, and so that's pretty cool. It's our first chance to really get a close-up look at one of these things. All right, another cool image from early in the mission, Perigo 14. We call it the Nautilus, which you probably can see why we call it that. A very cool feature. We, you know, it stood out right away. We have a habit of naming these things that what we think they look like. So, uh, one of the things that was very cool about this is the pop up clouds, as you see here on the edges of these bands of. I don't know if you want to call them spiral arms or wherever there's a kind of turbulent motion going on, you see these pop-up clouds popping up, uh, wafting into the upper atmosphere. So we've been studying that. This is an image by Kevin, processed by Kevin Gill. And so here we go. Uh, this is this is an image from Hubble Space Telescope. And we have a Hubble. It's a support program where Hubble's taking images, global images of Jupiter while Juno is uh, zipping in and taking close-up pictures. So we can get kind of a global context. And so this Nautilus feature is up in the north. It's up here. Uh, I think you can actually see it in the Hubble image. And these are some of the pop-up clouds here. You can see the shadows being cast on the cloud deck below. And here's a scale, it's about 100 kilometers. Um, so we there's a lot going on in this slide, but may, basically what I wanted to show was how we're getting heights from the shadows. And it's geometry, it's you know, trigonometry. But what we're finding, and I think it's actually on the next slide, but we're finding that these clouds are about, no, oh, it's not. OK, they're about 20 kilometers above the lower cloud deck. And so that's interesting to be able to get altitude information from a public outreach camera. And we never expected to be able to do that, but because we have such good resolution, we're able to do a little science. Okay, so <clears throat> another thing that we saw, now this is, I don't know if you guys know Clyde Foster, he's an amateur astronomer in South Africa. A really good guy, really good amateur astronomer, and he sends lot. He uploads lots of images to the Mission Juno website, and in the course of his normal 
Jupiter obs observations, he came across one night this new uh, storm brewing uh, near the Great Red Spot. And it got dubbed Clyde Spot. He didn't name it. He's too modest for that. But somehow it got back to him and he, he, it became Clyde Spot. It just so happened. He, alert, he uploaded these images to the Mission Juno website. He told us, hey, I'm seeing this, this new storm. And uh, he even see, sees it in the methane here. And so we just so happened to be flying over with Juno, that very region. So we took a look. And this is what we saw. It is, a, it, so it was a giant vortex that was just forming. So we got to see it when it was just forming. We did actually, this, uh, somebody was asking about methane images. This is one of the methane images from Juno Cam. So that's what it looks like. It's been processed to get rid of all the glint and everything. But the methane image, of course, is showing us higher altitude clouds. It's sensitive to particles higher in the atmosphere that reflect light before it gets absorbed by the methane in the atmosphere. So, and uh, so it, it's telling us where uh, clouds are high in this visible image. And let's see. A lot of cool stuff going on here. We think maybe there's gravity waves going on here, right here. So very cool. So uh, around the same time, my colleague Glenn Orton and I and some other colleagues were observing on the uh, infrared telescope facility, NASA IRTF on Mauna Kea. And we were looking in the near infrared. This is actually five micron image, thermal. And so what you're seeing here is the thermal radiation coming through the clouds, holes in the clouds. So everywhere that it's bright <clears throat> is thermal radiation coming from below. And everywhere it's dark, clouds are in the way blocking the light. And so we here we are, we see Clyde Spot. We got to see it from Earth in one of the big, big telescopes. And so uh, here is Clyde here. And he's pointing out, this is when we were observing on the RTF and he was sitting in, he's been sitting in on our, our observing runs and uh, he really wanted to see us watch his spot. And there we see it right there. So uh, what we did was we, we watched it over several months. We watched it evolve both with Genocam and from uh, ground-based images and Hubble. And we watched it kind of evolve. It was started as a tight a vortex and then it, came kind of unwound into something like the folded filamentary region. So it was very interesting to see that happen. So yes, so this is an example. The reason I'm showing you this is because uh, this is an example of uh, collaboration with the Juno mission, uh, Pro-Am, amateur astronomers helping us out. Uh, you, you guys get a lot more temporal coverage you're watching all the time you see all these things pop up and go away and so it, it gives us global context for the close-up images that Junocam is snapping so that's very encouraged and welcome another thing we're looking at is the the moons galilean satellites so these are images i don't remember what perigo this is earlier in the mission uh alessandro processed these and so these are kind of far flybys of Io. Io is on the left. And this is Europa and Ganymede. And uh, more recently, we have a series of Io images. These just came down in July. A little bit closer. These were processed by uh, Jason Perry, another citizen scientist. So we're starting to get a little bit better resolution. We're starting to look at the volcanoes, uh, it's going to really be good when we get up close to, to Io later in the mission. Uh, can we ask a couple more questions? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So I see a lot of these images were from your citizen scientists. Yeah. So is there a percentage or is, is half the images you publish from them or less or, or more? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we do use a lot of, i mean we're also processing the images ourselves and these i'm pulling off the mission juno website so it's kind of a 
combination of both. Um, and, you know, with all of what we understand from Earth weather, isn't there any equivalence we can draw from all these storms that are occurring on Jupiter? I mean, do we have any ideas or, I mean, what's going on? Why are they happening? Yeah, uh, well, we, we do use Earth as an analog for what we're seeing on Jupiter. Uh, my colleague, Sean Bruchaber, as I mentioned, uh, studying that thunderstorm, he is definitely looking at Earth analogs to try to compare what we're seeing on Jupiter. Is, does it resemble stuff that we see on Earth? And what does that tell us about what's going on? There are some differences. I mean, Earth has a solid surface. So it's uh, the weather is different because you've got a surface atmosphere interface, whereas on Jupiter, we don't have a solid surface. It's just all atmosphere. So there's some differences in how things work. But it's the same physics. And you know it's the same stuff, so there are similarities, and so we can learn about weather on Jupiter, what it tells us about weather on Earth. And and Chandrasekhar Nori, he says he's kind of stuck at the rotation speed, except for Kepler's law. I don't know anything about planetary dynamics. Why was that rotation speed chosen? And he says, sorry to distract again, but he's still puzzling yeah. over that. That's actually a good question. And to tell you the truth, I don't know the answer to that. It may be on the Mission Juno website because there's a lot of kind of background of the mission. But that's a good question as to how we ended up with two rotations a minute and what the reason is behind that. I'm not entirely sure. And could you remind us how many pixels do you have to work with on your CCD cameras? This is 1,600 pixels across. So Six, 16 by 1600. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's not a tremendous amount of pixels. So no, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a, a public outreach camera. We were just going to take pretty pictures. So we never really intended to do science with it, but maybe, maybe we could take a trip up there and put in a modern CMOS camera. That might be a good thing to do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it takes a long time for NASA to approve things and, uh, you know, to approve the science payloads and stuff. By the time we get the mission built and we get it up there, you know, it's it, the technology is, is uh, a little, a few years behind. So, and then there's weight considerations and all these other things, how much mass you can loft out to Jupiter. All right, that's, I guess that's all we have for now. Sure, no problem. Okay, so let me catch up on my notes here. Uh-huh, yeah, so, okay. And so then we, as I mentioned, we had the close-up encounter with Ganymede. And so this is an image processed by Kevin Gill. and this was i mean we flew about a thousand kilometers over the surface and so we got a really good look at ganymede and it so close that it changed our orbit but that was intentional um this is probably the <clears throat> closest image we've had since the galileo spacecraft was snapping pictures uh, in the 90s we looked we were we were looking to see if there's been any changes to the craters since we last were looking in the 90s but and we thought for a moment we thought that we had seen you know a change but it turned out that it wasn't it was a false alarm it, we saw the same craters in the voyager images so it looks like things are pretty static but <clears throat> while junocam was taking these pretty pictures we had the mwr instrument probing the subsurface ice on ganymede and uh, other instruments measuring magnetic fields so there's a lot of stuff going on. It was a good encounter. And we can't wait to go by Europa in a month or two. OK, so we're at the Mission Juno website. So I thought I'd kind of take you guys through what the website looks like. Uh, let me see if this works. And hopefully, uh, I've. Hopefully the links, the, all the links that are in my presentation here will be in the chat somewhere at some point. So you don't have to be writing these down and worrying about that. Okay, so this is the Mission Juno website. This is the portal where everything is. We put all the images from JunoCam up here as soon as they come down. And you can uh, make a, a login. 
you can make your own login and, and sign in to the site. Um, let's see. So over here on the menu, there's a, there's a little bit about the story. It's a, all the basics of the spacecraft launch and how we got there. I don't know if it talks about the RPMs. I haven't looked, but it may be uh, on there. And this is kind of the whole mission to deorbit. We were supposed to deorbit after the primary mission. That, that was the plan, but then we got extended. So we live to and we live for another day. Um, so there's some news. There's the team. The mission Parajoves here just is a little bit about every Parajove, every flyby of Jupiter that we do close past is on here. This is, goes from when we arrived all the way to the end and what longitude we're flying over. And the planned observation. So what this is, is a Google Doc, Google Sheets, what do they call it? Um, this is a spreadsheet of all the professional observations that are going on, Earth-based observations uh, by Perijove here. So uh, it gives you a schedule of what all the uh, professional astronomers are doing and where they're doing it. This is the Hubble instrument. This is this is Glenn Orton and, and me um, on the RTF using the SPECS instrument, which is a near-infrared camera. So that's kind of neat to just keep up with what people are doing and then what Juno is doing at the same time. Okay, so now, so this, the good stuff is Juno, Cam, and I will, let me click on that, okay. So this is the Juno Cam portion of the website, <clears throat> and there's different sections involved. There's a little bit of, here's a technical paper, it's some little information about the instrument, but the planning section is where you guys, if you want, would upload your Jupiter images uh, if you're observing Jupiter. That's where the amateur community is helping us out with um, with their imagery. And you can see uh, some recent images of Jupiter that have come up by various observers. And there are some submission guidelines here. This is where you would upload the data right here. Um, oh, you have to be signed up to do that. Uh -huh. Let me, uh, let me log in. Okay. All right. Let me see if this will work. Okay. So, uh, yes. So if you upload the data, uh, this is the naming format we prefer. And there's a lot of reason for that, but it just helps to have a, Kind of a consistent naming convention and you can put title date of observation time some people put plate scale and longitude latitude uh, which is all very helpful and then you just submit and it uploads to the the website where i will i'm one of the administrators so i have to approve but it all goes up there and so you can see what everyone's doing um, all the recent observations let's see if i can show you what that looks like Okay, um, so these are all observations that people have uploaded that I have yet to approve, but a um, lot of good stuff. And some people are taking methane images, um, which is very cool too. All right, let me get out of this because this is the the admin. Okay, so that's the the planning section. Uh, we call it the planning because we were actually at one time using. The, well, we are. We are using these images that you guys are uploading, that amateurs are uploading to help show us what we may be flying over. And I'll talk about that in a minute. There is a discussion section, which is where everybody hangs out to ask questions of things, um, just discuss stuff that's going on. Um, these are recent images of Ganymede, it looks like, that somebody put up here. So that's kind of neat. Um, the voting, we're not doing anymore. But earlier in the mission, we were having people actually vote on what 
their favorite storms and cloud features were on Jupiter and name them. And then uh, whatever was voted on, uh, JunoCam would take closer images of. But uh, that was earlier in the mission. That's not happening right now. So this is the image processing section. And this is where all the JunoCam data is. So, uh, and you can see that here, these are PJ43 uh, images that have come down from the spacecraft. You know that they're the JunoCam images because they just say NASA SWERI MS cubed. <clears throat> now you can go here to the mission phases. You can search by any perigeov you want. We're, right now, we just finished 43. I'll just do that. And you can apply that filter. Um, and if you click both, what you will get is the images from JunoCam, and you'll also get everybody else's processed stuff. So people are putting GIFs up here of uh, motion in the clouds. Um, some of it is color enhanced. Some of it's artwork. So. If I just focus on the JunoCam images. OK, so these are the raw images that have come down from Malin Space Science Systems. They put them up here. Let me click on one of them. OK, so this is a set of images. There are GB. Here's R. GB, and then the map projected uh, RGB combined image. So when you click on download images here, that's what you'll get. You'll get a little folder with the R, the G, and the B, and then the map projected RGB. And then you'll, I'm not sure if you get the methane image, if there is one, maybe. And then you get <clears throat> the overall, the raw data. So this is what the raw data looks like before it's been map projected. It, these are all what's called the framelets. These are the R and the G and the B, and they're, they're little framelets. I don't know if I can zoom in on that. And some people are taking these actual framelets and processing them into images. I'm not sure quite how they're doing that, but they are. If you click on the metadata, that will give you uh, the geometry information, latitude, longitude, how far away the spacecraft was from the cloud tops, things like that. So that's a useful information. And so you would just download here or down there, and you'll get these images. They'll be JPEGs. I believe they're JPEGs or PNGs. I'm not sure. And you, you can just play with them. And people have their different processing systems. So everybody's kind of doing it their own way. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, let's close that. So that's where the data is. And then you can upload after you've downloaded it, after you've processed it, made it look cool, done artwork with it, put smiley faces, whatever you want to do with it, you can upload it back here into the processing section. And you can name it and do a lot of stuff with it. You retain copyright to these images if you want. So you get credit for everything. We do show these things, actually, in, in, uh, in public talks, in conferences all around the world. Uh, NASA headquarters sees these things. So they are used and appreciated. And the final section here is it's called the think tank. And it's it's a place to talk science. It's more science uh, driven. And so people from the JunoCam team will comment on, on uh, any topics that come up. So it's kind of an interesting part of the website. There's a little rundown of Mission Juno. And you'll have a link in the chat where you can go. You can, make an account, and you can start downloading data and messing with it. So I think I got all of that. And this is the image format. Yeah, so uh, Pro-Am observations. These are professional, amateur. Uh, a lot of you guys probably are snapping pictures of Jupiter. 
Um, they help us get a global context because JunoCam, as someone mentioned, small field of view. Uh, I mean, it's a 58 degree field of view, but we're going very close over the planet. So there's these little postage stamp close ups. And so we need a global context of what's going on. We also need a temporal context, any kind of events that are going on, like Clyde Spot that just pop up out of nowhere. Uh, that helps us uh, kind of know what we're about to see, about to fly over. If we happen to fly over some of those things, we can take a close look. And then the predict maps I will show you is what I do with all your observations that you upload of Jupiter. I use those to try to predict where what we're going to see when Juno flies over that. And um, and then there's a citizen science project that we just launched that I will get to in a minute on Zooniverse. So these are some observations by uh, a fellow named Chris Go in the Philippines. I don't know if some of you guys know him. He's very prolific, a very good observer, and he has a Celestron C14, which I'm really jealous about because I wish I had one of those. And he's snapping all these great images uh, from the Philippines. So these were just a few nights ago. Uh, RGB, and he also does methane. Great images, and I use his stuff a lot for my predict maps. At the same time, we have we're looking on the big scopes on, on Mauna Kea. Um, this is the RTF telescope we were actually just on a few nights ago, and we snapped these images. Um, this is 3.8 microns. Where's my pointer? Oops. I don't know what happened to my pointer, but anyway, on the left is 3.8 microns, which is sensitive to the the cloud deck, the main cloud deck, but it's also sensitive to the aurora, which you can see up at the poles there, down the poles. Um, that's the Jupiter aurora, aurora that are uh, visible in this wavelength. There's also another wavelength that we use to just look at the aurora. Everything else goes away and you just see the aurora at the poles. Um, and this is the great red spot rising on the left. And on the right hand image is another five micron thermal image that we snapped. You see that the red spot is actually dark in five microns, which means it's a lot of clouds there. What we're seeing on the left is high altitude hazes over the red spot. And something that's interesting to note is we're seeing a very, very blank northern hemisphere lately in five microns, which means it's very heavily clouded over. There's not much radiation getting through, and that's unusual. So we don't really know what's going on there. OK, so these are amateur Jupiter maps, Crisco and others that I've pulled off of the Mission Juno website. Uh, this was for the most recent perigeove on July 5th. What I do is I put these into a map, map project them all, and then I roll them forward in time to the perigeove date and time and try to see where JunoCam is flying over. I wish I could, oh, there's my cursor. So the, <clears throat> the purple region is the JunoCam field of view, and the green is the Juno ground track over the planet. And so this is showing everything that JunoCam is within JunoCam's field of view at some point as we fly over. So you can see we flew over some cool spots. We, we missed the red spot this time, didn't get it but we have in the past. So uh, I'm using these, uh, all your images that you se uh, send up to the website, I'm using these to try to predict what we're gonna fly over and so that we can uh, worry about integration times and optimize what JunoCam's gonna see and what JunoCam's gonna look for too. Okay, <clears throat> so any questions so far? Not oh, we don't have any post-it questions. Anyone oh. in the room have a question? No, I think we're all good okay. for now. Sounds good. I'll just keep on going. So this is a new uh, citizen science project that we just launched on Zooniverse. Uh, and it is a vortex hunter, jo Jovian vortex hunter. We want everyone to help us uh, uh, identify and catalog all these giant vortices going on in Jupiter's atmosphere and small vortices too. So this is a tool that allows people to 
sift through the Junocam images and uh, draw circles around or ellipses around uh, what we th what you think is a vortex and kind of describe it its properties. And so it's kind of a cool, neat tool that we just launched to uh, involve everybody in helping us to catalog all these uh, strange things going on on Jupiter using the Junocam imagery. So you can go check that out. And I, I've put this link in with all the other links. So you can click on that. OK, so processing of Junocam data, uh, it's kind of a grab bag. I, <clears throat> one thing to do probably would be to poke around on the Mission Juno website, and you can email some of these guys, Kevin Gill, Brian Swift, uh, and ask them how they're doing it, because everybody has kind of a black box processing favorite way to process. There's also another fella in Germany, uh, Gerald Eichstadt, and he has his, uh, he's a mathematician in Germany, and he has his own little process that he doesn't like to tell anybody about. And, and he's actually doing some really good work. He helps us out a lot in getting the geometry and getting, processing all these images in a mathematical way. But there are a couple of GitHub Blender pipelines that I am aware of. I know very little about them, but the Brian Swift has one, and Kevin Gill has another one. And they are a whole pipeline that uh, will pull down Junocam images, will uh, map project them, will project them onto a a uh, Jupiter globe uh, in Blender. And so you can fly around. It's pretty cool stuff. I have no idea anything about it, but you, if you guys are inclined to look into that, and you might be able to make a little bit more sense of it than I do. What we use is something called ISIS-3. Um, this is the US Geological Survey. It's a, uh, it's free. It's, you can go to the website here and download it. It's not very user friendly, and it's got a steep learning curve. So it's hard to describe. But we, we mostly use that because we have a JunoCam module built into ISIS-3 um, that will uh, load up and uh, the Junocam data and split it into its little framelets and and you can process that way. So if if you're ambitious and you want to dig into that, um, go to this link and you can install ISIS on your system and play with that. A lot of the processing that we do that I do is just plain old Photoshop. Um, I yeah just to pull out details. I, I mess with layer modes and and curves and levels and and just pull out those colors and pull out the features uh, so you can do a lot just with photoshop or with any uh, you know image processing kind of software like that and then if you want to get to the real raw data it's sitting at the planetary data system atmospheres node uh, that's where all the science images are uh, deposited and you can pull down images from there and then you can feed them into ISIS and that's a very that's going to the the, the raw images and it uses something called spice data which is uh, the geometry information it's coming from the NASA servers uh, where the spacecraft is the geometry of the observation all the really nitty-gritty details so that if you really want to get heavy-duty um, you could do that uh, but, you know, if you're familiar with Photoshop, that works pretty well for me. Okay, so, and so these are some of the processing stars. These are the people that have really, you see them all the time popping up on the website. Um, there's Ch Gerald and Kevin and Bjorn Johnson, Brian Swift, uh, another fellow, John Rogers, I don't know if you guys know him. He's from the British Astronomical Association. And he is also a citizen scientist that does a lot of work with the Junocam imagery. He uh, likes to put the maps together and notate. And uh, there's a lot going on at his website there. So you might want to check that out. And he's real good about as, as answering questions and uh, easy to talk to. So definitely check him out. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have for you. Um, the Junocam instrument was supposed to be uh, just a public outreach 
CCD, pretty pictures, but it turned out to be getting these amazing images. Uh, and we're so close, so we're, we're getting really close up high spatial resolution. And it turns out that we can get a lot of science out of that. Uh, cloud motions and all kinds of things. So uh, we have the GenoCam observations are open public access immediately when they come down. So that is free for anyone to play with the data, to enhance, uh, to upload back to the website. Um, and that has led us to a lot of unexpected phenomena, a lot of discoveries like Clyde Spot, a lot of good stuff uh, pops out of these images when you enhance them a little bit. And so there's the website again. And this is the JunoCam team. So it's led by Candy Hansen, lead investigator, and Glenn Orton at JPL, and me and Sean, and Mike Gravon and Mike Kaplinger and the rest of the Malin Space Science System team. They are the ones who built the instrument. And they've built similar instruments for the Mars missions. And then Scott Bolton is the head of the whole Juno mission, Juno PI. OK, so that's pretty much all I had. I was just going to show you a few images uh, that people have processed, not just for science, but for art sake, uh, that I thought were pretty interesting. So this is one, uh, um, Amelia Carolina. She thought that she'd put a Juno Cam in, image into one of Van Gogh's paintings, Starry Night. I think that's Starry Night. And that was a great idea. I had not thought of that before. That is so cool. Yeah, isn't it cool? <laughs> I think it's cool. And I think this one, has, this, this image has gotten shown at many conferences around the world. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, Rita thought that she saw roses on Jupiter. And that is pretty cool, too. Uh, a lot of, I'm not sure what she did here. A lot of processing, a lot of filters. Looks good. Alfonso thought he saw, a, I think that's a lynx in the clouds. Oh. So that's kind of the Jupiter equivalent of laying on the grass and looking up at the sky and seeing things in the clouds and <laughs> people are doing that on jupiter and there's a lot to be seen there's also a dolphin somebody saw a dolphin at some point so this is oh boy namanith uh did kind of a watercolor image of the storms page of 26 and I, I thought that was a good one too so people are getting very creative. It's not just about enhancing the images for science. It's also they're playing with it and doing all kinds of filters and and uh, layer modes and all kinds of things to make art out of the, out of these images. And it's kind of fun to see uh, people's creativity. So this is a bunch of people that worked on this one, but someone saw a cloud breathing dragon on Jupiter, and. <laughs> So you can see the dragon, you can see the cloud spewing out of its mouth. I think that's pretty neat. I think that's what I was going to close on. Yes. So there you go. So artwork is encouraged too. Oh, that's great, Tom. Yeah. So yeah, I think we all we all kind of watch this and say, geez, should we really go and start downloading these images? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough to do. Uh, right. You can, you can stop sharing if you want. Okay, let me see how to do that. Mm -mm -mm, stop presenting. Okay. Stop presenting. And there and was Tom, one question we didn't get to. Oh. Uh, when the Thomas uh, Fowler said, regarding lightning, mm. is there any idea how long these lightning strikes extend and how they compare to lightning strikes on Earth? Uh, I, they're very similar uh, to lightning on Earth, and uh, very they're flashing all the time, very quick uh, flashes of lightning, and we're trying to determine what level of the atmosphere they're going off. There's shallow lightning, there's deep lightning, and so we're trying to sort all of this out. Uh, but we've got several instruments that are uh, observing lightning, and, and we've a few cameras, not just JunoCam, but uh, some of the other instruments also are seeing lightning flashes going on. And so we're trying to catalog these, uh, you know, where are they? Uh, when do they seem to happen? 
Um, they seem to be more prevalent in the north and the south, and that's another puzzle we don't really know. But yeah, it's 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 good old lightning, just like on Earth. Uh, where there's lightning, there's water, because that's how you have lightning. So that's another uh, aspect of the Juno mission is we're trying to map the water on Jupiter. Where is it? How deep is it? How much is there? So that's an outstanding question still. We haven't pinned it down yet, but we're working on it. Have you thought of the end of the program and what happens next? Or, or don't you want to think about that? We don't want to think about that. <laughs> We've got a lot going on until then. We have uh, three more years. So um, we're going to zip by these uh, the moons. Um, we're going to look for geysers on Europa. <clears throat> that's a kind of an un... A settled question are are there geysers active geysers going on in Europa I mean people have seen in Hubble images they've kind of seen hints that maybe there's geysers erupting but we don't really know so we're going to be looking for that and kind of a precursor the next big mission that's going to go out there is the Europa Clipper mission so we're snapping a few images ahead of time see what we see and then of course the volcanoes on Io the Europa Clipper what is that? That is uh, the next big NASA flagship mission. It's going to launch in a couple of years and head out to Jupiter again. It's going to specifically focus on Europa um, and and do lots of Europa flybys. I, yeah, I think, yeah, lots of close flybys of Europa. It's going to be mapping uh it's going to be seeing if there's uh, geysers going on it's going to be mapping the subterranean ocean uh, i think i mentioned that there's a, a an ocean on europa that's we think about two times earth's water and so there, there's something going on at europa and there's ideas that maybe there's life on europa in those oceans in that ocean down there under the ice could be there's a lot of tidal heating, so it's actually warmish down deep. So th there's no lander on that one, is there? Mm, there was at one point there was going to be. I, I They're talking, I think there is. I think there is. I'd have to check on that. I can't remember. They They keep changing, but I think there is. I thought I heard that there was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be cool. I mean, at one time they had all kinds of cool ideas. They were going to send down a uh, uh, something to bore through the ice. It was going to actually melt its way through the ice. Yeah, th I know they were talking about. That. Yeah, so that one didn't didn't fly, but that was real. I I I, I was voting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more questions or comments from the room, or can we yeah, wrap it had, up? You had mentioned the uh, the end. Days project is that a hard date based on equipment, or could it be extended again? Could the uh, could yeah, the... that's that's a good question. Um, the the limiting factor at Jupiter is radiation because there's these massive radiation belts, and I don't remember if I mentioned, but that's one of the reasons why we have these elongated orbits. We we want to spend most of our time out in space, away from the radiation, and then we want to swoop in really fast, take a lot of pictures and get out of there in two hours uh, so that we don't get fried, you know. But over time, we're accumulating radiation on the instruments. And actually, so far, uh, knock on wood, uh, we haven't really had as much radiation damage as we thought we would at this point in the mission. Uh, so we're chugging along, but it, it's as we're getting closer and closer, um, as the mission goes on, we're getting baked by the radiation more and more. And so that's probably going to be the limiting factor. The other limiting factor is fuel. We're going to get low on fuel sure. by that time. So, And when that happens, NASA doesn't like to have spacecraft just floating around uncontrolled out there. So they like to do a controlled deorbit, they call it to get rid of that's what we had to do with Cassini. It was very, very sad because we had a functioning spacecraft and it was great. Everything was healthy, but we had no fuel left and they didn't want to just leave it orbiting out there because it might crash into one of the satellites and uh, especially Enceladus, which has active geysers. They didn't want that to happen. So they made us dump it into Saturn and we watched it burn up and we cried. <laughs> are, are there any, are you accumulating any bad columns or pixels? 
in your community. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, th that's also something that's going on. We're having uh, slow deg degradation of the of the uh, CCD. Again, so far it's not that bad. It's not. You know, we were afraid that it was going to really start messing with us, but so far, not that many bad pixels. It's under control for now. We don't know what's coming in the future. Well, it seems like well, you've really made the most of it this time. We're, that you've squeezing, had, we're squeezing as much science as we can out of this thing. <laughs> you know, I think every every mission seems to be extended and extended, like the Mars missions. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess. Well, I we mean, do uh, a reasonably good job, and and yeah. things last longer than we think. Unlike a lot of products on Earth, right? That's true. Yes. Well, well, I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say anything about China. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, the JPL engineers are very conservative, so they build in a lot of redundancy and a lot of conservative estimates, and so we tend to go a lot longer than was the nominal mission and and it's a shame to waste a good spacecraft so we just keep as long as we have fuel and as long as everything's working it's cost effective to just keep extending and keep going oh, that's cool tom thanks very much that was a great presentation yeah, my uh, pleasure I'm, I'm i'm sure a lot of people are are pinging that site uh very good we welcome that and uh, you guys probably have my email in the chat somewhere. So if you have any questions that occur to you after, go ahead and send me an email. Uh, there's some nonsense going on in the chat over yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, I, 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 I killed it. Don't worry. Uh -oh. <laughs> I killed it and reported it. Uh oh, yeah. spam. Yeah, it's spam. Yeah, yeah it's spam. Spam's well, uh, if we're done, just everyone come on back uh, next week for uh, the remote observatory program. And I think we're all set for tonight. So who's in charge of taking us out? That would be me. That'd be you. And you're welcome to hang around where we have a little, you know, a little chat after the fact. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. See you all next week.